Welcome back to Calculus 2. In this lecture, we're going to look at some applications of what we've been talking about recently, Taylor and McLaurin series. There's some standard applications leading into higher level mathematics and what you may be using this for within your science and engineering courses. And we'll take a look at them right now. Okay, so let's think back to a previous lecture when we defined the nth Taylor polynomial. We use that in an example to approximate the value of sine of 0 0.2 or 0 0.2 radians. And we did that and we got a fairly accurate value by uh, using a few terms in the Taylor series, really the McLaurin series for sine of x. And we got a very accurate approximation. Now we're going to kind of build off of that and use uh, usually McLaurin series for another approximation idea. But it's now approximating not a function value, but here, what seems to be like a simple problem, evaluate an integral, we're gonna approximate it. Now I say this is a seemingly simple problem because as we're about to find out, this is not as simple as it seems. So we have what was called here a definite integral. We have uh, an integral with limits, a to b, here, 0 to 1. And this can basically be interpreted as area beneath the graph, here, of the function, e to the negative x squared. So it seems simple. We could have sketched this when you uh, were first introduced to definite integrals, probably at the end of your Calc 1 course. So what's the, the problem? Well, let's just try to proceed. When you have a definite integral, your main tool in calculus for evaluating them is the fundamental theorem of calculus. Now you can only apply the fundamental theorem of calculus if the function that you're integrating, here the function inside the integral, e to the negative x squared, if that has an antiderivative. So we try to find an antiderivative for e to the negative x squared. And once we find that, whatever that antiderivative is, if one exists, we might denote it as capital F of X. Then we just plug in the limits in the integral, A and B, and subtract. So we would get the value of this integral as F of one minus F of zero, where um, capital F denotes the antiderivative of E to the negative X squared. Okay, seems simple, right? Well, the problem is E to the negative X squared doesn't have an antiderivative. There is no antiderivative or function that exists that differentiates to e to the negative x squared. So no matter how hard we try, we're not going to be able to get an antiderivative to apply the fundamental theorem of calculus. Now we can still get a numerical value for this integral. For instance, your graphing calculator can probably do that. There's various numerical algorithms uh, that you might be learning in computer science or shortly thereafter of how you could do this. But we're gonna take an approach to, uh, from the ideas we're learning in our course of how we can uh, approximate this integral rather than find the exact value. A little bit later in this lecture, we're gonna go into detail about the difference between um, getting an approximate value or exact value for a, an expression of some sort when we get to what are called non-elementary functions and uh, functions defined as integrals, which might sound a little bit weird. So for the time being, let's transition to instead of trying to find the exact value for this integral from zero to one of e to the negative x squared, let's just try to approximate it. Now, how do we tie this in to what we've been talking about with power series and most recently Taylor and McLaurin series? Well, ideally, we try like we did with approximating sine of 0 0.2, we're gonna try to use some sort of Taylor series in practice, it's usually a McLaurin series for the function inside the integral. And if we can find a McLaurin series in this case for e to the negative x squared, then we can basically integrate that power series, the McLaurin series, term by term. Again, that is one of the main advantages of using power series. Calculus is very easy to do with powers of x, x to the n, x to the 2n x to the 2n plus 1, depending on um, certain power series representations. OK, so that hopefully gives you an idea of where we're going. We're going to take what we've been doing with Taylor and McLaurin series 
and use it to approximate other things here, integrals and uh, various calculus concepts. Now, what we defined with Taylor and McLaurin series in our last lecture was some other um, kind of uh, basic functions besides one over one minus x that we have McLaurin series for. Now, I don't want you to think that we're not uh, giving enough time to Taylor series, but McLaurin series are used a lot in practice within mathematics and, uh, for instance, physics and engineering, since these are basically um, usually with intervals of convergence between negative one and one, as you see for all these here. What's special about the interval of convergence negative one to one? Zero is right in the middle. And zero is a rather important number to mathematics. And there's lots of things within the uh, uh, various branches of science and engineering that deal with small approximations. Um, small values are close to zero. All right, now how do we put this to use for uh, approximating integrals? Well, we had our starting function, one over one minus x, and it's McLaurin series, which basically came from the, uh, the geometric series. All right, we then apply the tools of calculus to basically uh, integrate and differentiate one over one minus x. One of the ones that we got shortly after introducing the power series representation for one over one minus x was a power series representation for natural log of one plus x and inverse tangent. Now this is kind of maybe out of the order of what's stated in our textbook, which is fine. Here, the functions are kind of in order as we um, kind of developed them, came up on them. So we used one over one minus x very early on. Then by differentiating and integrating term by term, we had power series representations for natural log of one plus x and inverse tangent. All right, with McLaurin series, really the general case of a Taylor series, we can calculate the coefficients in a power series representation by calculating nth order derivatives. And we did that for two examples in detail, the function e to the x and the function sine of x. And we left it as, a, uh, as, a, as an exercise to you to maybe go forth and uh, take what we did for the uh, power series, McLaurin series for sine of x, and find that for cosine of x, pretty similar problem. All right, now these are gonna be our kind of main tools that we'll be applying through this lecture. If you're continuing deeper into um, higher level uh, science and engineering courses, you'll likely see some of these come back. So make sure you're at least familiar with these. So that way, for instance, in your uh, science or engineering course, when there's a small approximation being done in various contexts, you'll have an idea of where uh, the tools are coming from. Probably one of these McLaurin series. So definitely copy these down, pause the video if needed. Make sure you have these uh, readily available for the examples that we'll be getting to. And a lot of the uh, calculations we'll be doing are very similar to uh, how we first started to find power series representations for functions other than or related to one over one minus x by uh, making an algebraic uh, change or uh, plugging in for uh, x there. We'll be doing the same thing, but now for some of these other five existing McLaurin series. So we'll kind of uh, plug uh, algebraic expressions in for x to get uh, similar power series representations. You might already be, see, uh, be able to see where this is going for our intro problem, the integral involving e to the negative x squared. All right, so at this point, let's go ahead and jump into a few examples. Uh, again, these are very much like what we did with our uh, kind of first set of problems earlier a few lectures ago. We manipulated one over one minus x and our expression to fit that form, one over one minus something. Now maybe we had to uh, think of the, um, the expression as being one minus a negative, Maybe we have to uh, plug in instead of um, x, we have to have x over two there. For instance, if we have a factor of two in that denominator, for instance, two plus x, a lot of different algebraic manipulations. We did a bunch of examples on that, but it all came back to this 
basic power series representation for one over one minus X. We're gonna be doing something similar here, but instead of the McLaurin series, power series representation for one over one minus X, we'll be using them maybe as you can see here, starting with e to the X and cosine of X. All right, so let's go through part A together. Since our function that we're asked to find the McLaurin series for, an expansion centered around zero, it's e to the negative x squared. And if we think through that list of McLaurin series on the previous page, it probably looks most similar to the McLaurin series for e to the x. So like we did earlier, instead of writing our expression in the form one over one minus something, we try to fit our function into the form e raised to something in that bottom version there. And then whatever that something is up in the exponent of base e, then you plug that in into the power series and you have some algebraic expression raised to the nth power. This is actually simple. Most of the work was done in developing the Taylor and here McLaurin series. And now that we've put all that time in, we can kind of reap the benefits. That happens a lot in mathematics. You do a, a lot of complicated stuff, spend a lot of time developing a lot of ideas, and then sometimes, like now, some things become very easy or minimal work. So all we have to do is basically take our generic general power series representation there, e raised to something, and we're just gonna plug in negative x squared. We plug that in up in the exponent, that gives us our function, e raised to the negative x squared. And then we plug in negative x squared within the summation, just being careful to take the nth power of negative x squared. All right, and the calculations are very minimal. Again, all the work was done in developing these McLaurin series. And the problem is actually pretty simple. If you felt comfortable with finding power series representations for functions related to one over one minus x, this is kind of very similar. All right, let's go ahead and uh, give you an attempt at part B. Um, we'll check in in a few minutes. There's not a whole lot of surprises here. You can probably see your starting McLaurin series that you want to build from and manipulate. Pause the video and we'll check in in a few minutes. All right, welcome back. For this, uh, this problem, I don't think there's a lot of um, a lot of complicated uh, uh, functions to possibly consider here. Uh, we only really had one of those functions in the list related to cosine, and it was just the McLaurin series for cosine of just x. And like we did with our previous example, the McLaurin series for e to the x, instead of having x in this expression, we can just think of it as cosine of something equals this power series, where it's the something raised to the 2n power. We're going to make an algebraic replacement here inside that uh, empty spot to get our function here. We want 2x, and that's kind of our first step. So in this generic McClure series for cosine of something, we're going to plug in 2x. Just be careful with your uh, order of operations. You're plugging 2x and then taking the 2n power of that. So you're going to raise both 2 and x, both factors, to the 2n power. All right, and if we do that, what we have is a McLaurin series for the function cosine of 2x. Now, how do we build that up to our function? Well, the only thing that's missing from cosine of 2x to get our function is an additional factor of x. So like we did earlier with examples related to one over one minus x, we can just multiply that here factor of x into the summation, which is again, one of the other main reasons 
to manipulate and work with power series. Multiplying powers of x, it's really simple. You can add their exponents. So as long as you know McLaurin series, here the problem all basically fell into place if you know or are comfortable with the McLaurin series for cosine of x. And it's very minimal work from there. Just in the very last step, so you see it, the McLaurin series for cosine involves x to the 2n. Since we have that factor of x out front, we multiply that factor of x times x to the 2n. We can multiply that by adding the exponents to get x to the 2n plus 1. You're probably comfortable with all those uh, exponent manipulations from what we've been looking at with power series uh, for the past few lectures. Okay, now a lot of the other examples that you might encounter in homework, quizzes, and exams really just take as your starting place one of those other functions. Perhaps maybe sine of x in its McLaurin series, inverse tangent in its McLaurin series, natural log of 1 plus x. There's not a um, whole lot of variety for what's expected for uh, students at this level in calculus too. As you continue into higher level mathematics, maybe physics, and some of your engineering courses, you'll start to see uh, Taylor McLaurin series for other functions come up. All right, let's take a look at a, another use for McLaurin series. Again, they're probably the ones most used in practice, a little more than uh, Taylor series, an expansion around some non-zero value. And we can actually use a McLaurin series to go back to our intro problem while we can't find the exact value of this integral, the integral from zero to one of e to the negative x squared, we can approximate it to basically whatever degree of accuracy we want. All right, maybe give yourself an attempt at this. This is very similar to how we um, approximated earlier, sine of 0 0.2 using a fifth degree Taylor polynomial. The only difference now is we're not approximating a function value or a number, but rather an integral. So just to give a hint before you maybe attempt this, think of a McLaurin series for e to the negative x squared. I don't know when you might have encountered that, <clears throat> example 1a. <clears throat> and then since that's inside an integral, integrate it. We'll check in in a few minutes hopefully with what we've been covering in the past few lectures and today you can put the pieces together to make a good attempt at example two we'll check in in a few minutes All right, let's go through example two. This is a um, pretty useful type of problem to understand. Um, integrals pop up a lot. A lot of integrals are complicated, and it might actually be quicker to do an approximation like we are here than to get the exact value. All right, just to give some insight into this, a visualization, this function e to the negative x squared pops up in a few places. This is a very basic version of what's more generally known as the normal distribution, as you might, as you might have uh, covered or learned about in a uh, basic, uh, basic statistics course. All right, so with this, this is your graph of e to the negative x squared. What we're looking for is the area beneath that graph and above the x-axis over the interval of x values from zero to one. So we have our graph there. You might have called, uh, doing an example, sketching a function like this back in your Calc 1 course using first and second derivatives. And we just look at the area there, so we have this nice curvy area. Getting the exact value is difficult, but we can, using various numerical algorithms, what your graphing calculator is capable of, you can get a pretty accurate approximation with just a, a few, uh, few terms, as we'll see. So using a numerical algorithm, you get here a pretty good approximation for this integral. 
as 0 0.746824. And I did that using Wolfram Alpha. Now you can get a more accurate uh, approximation, including more digits in that approximation, but that'll suffice for uh, our example. All right, now how do we actually use the tools that we've been talking about, Taylor, but more specifically, McLaurin series to do this approximation? Well, as long as you again know some basic functions and their McLaurin series, we can very quickly approximate this integral. So in our previous example, example 1a, we found the McLaurin series for this function, e to the negative x squared. This is a pretty important function. Recall we said it has no antiderivative, which is why we're relying on the approximation ideas. And the McLaurin series is pretty simple. e to the x has a very simple McLaurin series, and we just replace x with negative x squared. Now, this is an infinite series, but just for ease of calculation, uh, the problem doesn't say anything about to what degree of accuracy we want our approximation, but a usual rule of thumb may be the first few terms. Uh, so here we have, what is that? I can't even count one. Four terms uh, going up to x to the sixth. So let's just kind of think of e to the negative x squared and approximate it with the first four terms, we can do that mathematically. Values of x between zero and one are small. And think what happens to a small number as you raise it to increasingly larger powers. A small number raised to a large power is gonna get really, really, really small. So probably once you go beyond, in all honesty, probably even that quadratic term, x squared, the values get pretty small. We're going to use a few more terms here, the first four terms, including up to x to the sixth, and we'll actually find that we get a very accurate approximation. All right, so let's just kind of approximate this with the first few terms. If you add more terms, you'll get a more accurate approximation. And that's not going to suffice for our problem. We want to now integrate this since we're trying to integrate the function e to the negative x squared. We replace the function with its McLaurin series, again, ignoring some issues of convergence. And we basically now integrate term by term. We decided for this example, we're just going to use the first four terms, which basically go from one up to x to the sixth. If you want to include more uh, terms beyond that, you'll get a more accurate approximation. But uh, you'll see momentarily that these four terms gives a very accurate approximation. All right, so again, the main benefit of McLaurin series and power series in general is calculus is very easy here for finding antiderivatives with powers of x. Just apply your basic power rule. And at that point, since we have a definite integral, we just plug in 0 and 1 for x and subtract. The nice thing about powers of x, when x is 0, you just get 0. So the entire uh, uh, antiderivative here, when you evaluate it at x equals 0, just becomes 0. And plugging in x as 1, 1 to any power is also pretty nice. So we really here just get this uh, difference in sum of coefficients, 1 minus a third plus a tenth minus 1 over 42. And what we get is a very good approximation. You might be able to see it in the upper right corner from what Wolfram Alpha gave me. We get is our approximation using the first four terms for the McLaurin series of e to the negative x squared, 0 0.742857. And that's, that's pretty accurate compared to that value up there in red. All right, so just with four terms, we get a very accurate approximation. If for science and engineering purposes, you needed a uh, more accurate approximation, include more terms that you're using uh, from your uh, uh, Taylor or McLaurin series, and that will generally give you a more accurate approximation. 
All right, for the second part of this lecture or application, we're gonna to transition to a um, kind of different topic. We'll tie this into our intro problem, something about e to the negative x squared having no antiderivative, and we'll um, be a little more specific about that. If you plug e to the negative x squared into uh, an online integral calculator or Wolfram uh, Alpha, you do get an answer, but it may not be apparent what that uh, answer or function means. So we'll uh, kind of go into detail with that now with what are called non-elementary functions. All right, so if you were to try to answer this question, this indefinite integral, just finding an antiderivative for e to the negative x squared, uh, on the right-hand side of that integral, there's no function that we can give that makes sense as that antiderivative for e to the negative x squared. Now, for us to define what are called non-elementary functions, let's go into detail about what the elementary functions are. Very basically and briefly, the elementary functions are all the functions that you were introduced to in your pre-calculus course and basically through Calc 1 and now Calc 2. Here we have powers of x, radicals, nth roots, e to the x, exponential functions, logarithms, natural log of x, all six trig functions, as well as inverse functions, specifically inverse trig functions. Those are all elementary functions, functions that we can write down with a um, simple formula uh, or function in terms of x. Now, one of the nice things about these elementary functions is you can combine them together using your five basic operations of functions. You can add, subtract, multiply, and divide functions, but you can also form a composite function plugging one function into another. So if you take any elementary function and another one that's elementary and perform these five basic operations, the result is also an elementary function. Pretty much most functions we have encountered in the calculus sequence up until now are elementary. We can uh, basically write them down with a simple formula or expression in terms of x. All right, let me give you an example of a non-elementary function. Non-elementary functions can't be expressed as a combination of elementary functions. So there is basically no way here for the answer or antiderivative of e to the negative x squared. It cannot be expressed as a combination of elementary functions. That's what we mean when we say e to the negative x squared has no antiderivative. What we really mean is e to the negative x squared has no elementary antiderivative. An antiderivative that can be expressed as these basic elementary functions or combination thereof. Now, if you did plug e to the negative x squared into an integral calculator, you'll probably get a function called the error function. And it's not a mistake. Error here doesn't mean something's wrong. It's just the name from what popped up in uh, probability theory early on in its uh, development. So let's go ahead and introduce a very important idea not necessarily to our course, but the seeds of it do start now. Some non-elementary functions, like here, the antiderivative of e to the negative x squared, while we can't write them down as combinations of elementary functions, we might be able to express these non-elementary functions as certain integrals. And that might sound a little bit weird, expressing a function as an integral, but mathematically it can be done. There are some simple ones. I'll give you some of my personal favorites. The first is an answer for an antiderivative, or as close as we can get, to e to the negative x squared. The first one here is called the error function. It's written in uh, function notation. The function is like uh, denoted as sine of x, but here it's denoted as erf, or the error function of x. And there's a factor of two divided by square root of pi out front. And then in the integral, the lower limit is a number zero, the upper limit is a variable x. 
Notice within our integral, the variable is t. So once you integrate this over t, you then plug in your limits, 0 and x, and you're left with a function or expression in terms of x. Except we can't do that here because e to the negative t squared or e to the negative x squared has no elementary antiderivative. So the error function, we can't write down a formula for it in terms of elementary functions. We have to leave the error function here defined as this um, function defined as an integral. This pops up in probability theory, uh, some places in theoretical physics, what's called quantum field theory, but uh, we don't have time to go off on that <clears throat> tangent. All right, there's some other functions expressed as integrals that you might cover and get to in physics, optics, when you uh, mathematically look at the phenomenon called diffraction. And these are called the Fresnel integrals, dealing with a uh, type of diffraction called Fresnel diffraction, again, beyond the scope of our course. And they are basically defined as integrals, respectively, of sine and cosine of t squared. And like e to the negative t squared, sine of t squared and cosine of t squared, they don't have elementary antiderivatives. So the expressions here for s of x and c of x, these Fresnel integrals, uh, that's pretty much as best as we can write those functions down defined as antiderivatives, or here, integrals. All right, now again, this gets into some complicated areas in mathematics, defining functions as integrals, but let's kind of uh, take a look at an alternate way to define or understand these peculiar functions. It is okay to leave them defined as integrals. You can perform calculus with, for instance, the error function. Recall differentiation and integration are inverse operations. But we might want to have a um, kind of a nicer formula. Perhaps the idea of uh, defining a function as an integral is a little, little complicated. So let's see if we can apply power series, specifically again, McLaurin series, to find a way to alternately define or write these peculiar functions. All right, let's take a look at example three. The question is just going to ask, find the McLaurin series for the error function. Now, I'd like you to make an attempt at this. We've been using one example a lot. Notice the function here involves integrating e to the negative t squared. Aside from the new variable t, See if you can incorporate a previous McLaurin series and then integrate that from zero to x. You'll very quickly and easily get the McLaurin series for what we call the error function. We'll check in in a few minutes. All right, welcome back. I want to use the function e to the negative x squared, or he, here e to the negative t squared. It occurs a lot moving beyond this course. There's no elementary antiderivative for it, but we can at least express e to the negative t squared in terms of its McLaurin series. All right, we did that earlier. That was example 1a. We're just changing the variable x to t. And since we have that inside the integral from 0 to x, we're going to integrate that term by term. So we basically replace e to the negative t squared inside the integral with its McLaurin series. We interchange the order of the summation and integration. And what we're left with, since all those uh, uh, kind of uh, general nth terms are constants with respect to t, they all involve negative 1 to the n and n factorial, we can move those factors in front of the integral or through the integral sign and we're left with a remarkably simple integral integrating t to the 2n. Now, aside from the new variable t, we can just apply the power rule for antiderivatives. And in red down there, we add 1 to the exponent, 
to get t to the 2n plus 1 power, and then we divide by the new power. Since we have limits 0 and x, we evaluate that antiderivative from t equals 0 to t equals x. At 0, it just becomes 0, and when you plug x in, you'll get x to the 2n plus 1. All right, and that is basically it. Now, this might be a more comfortable way to define the error function. It's uh, what we've been talking about with power series, Taylor and McLaurin series, but it's still defining the function as uh, an infinite series. At least that's more within the realm of our course topics and hopefully makes you a little more comfortable than defining the error function as an integral. If you're moving into higher level science and engineering courses, try to be comfortable with both ways to define these um, peculiar functions. All right, I want to close with some related examples. We mentioned the Fresnel integrals earlier, and these ones are very similar to example three. Uh, I'd like you to make an attempt at them on your own, and it follows basically the outline of example three. You can probably already see where this is going. I'll give some hints and checkpoints. You basically just use, instead of the starting McLaurin series for e to the x, the McLaurin series for sine of x and cosine of x. Since we're dealing with functions sine and cosine of t squared, make the replacement x going to t squared in both those McLaurin series, and integrate term by term, and you should get those stated McLaurin series for these Fresnel integrals.